from the Swiss Alps to the Canadian Rockies, celebrating unique connections between Switzerland and Canada. Brought to you by the Swiss representations in Canada. Hello and welcome to this edition of the podcast from the Alps to the Rockies. My name is Urs Obrist. I'm the Senior Science and Technology Counselor at the Embassy of Switzerland. It is my pleasure to welcome today Lorenz Lüthi. He is Professor in International Relations History at McGill University in Montreal and a renowned expert on Cold War history. Lorenz Lüthi grew up in the canton of Basel Landschaft, where he went to school in Reinach and then followed his deep-seated interests in history with studies at the University of Zurich, Ohio University, and a PhD from Yale University. Since August 2003, he has been working in the Department of History and Classical Studies at McGill University. He joins us from Montreal today in a time where history, the Cold War, and international relations are in many people's minds. So welcome. Well, thank you very much for your invitation and for having me on your podcast. I have been now in Canada for almost 20 years and uh, my relations to Switzerland are still here. Um, I never thought I would end up in Canada. It was not planned. Um, as so often, you know, accidents happen in history, you know, coincidences, contingencies, right? That's what I study too. As was already mentioned, I grew up near Basel uh, in the 70s and 80s at the end of the Cold War. Um, my father was Swiss. My mother originally came from Germany. In fact, she grew up in a part of Germany that became Soviet occupied and then East Germany. And for me, in, in this island of Switzerland, this Cold War island, uh, the Cold War was always a topic every single day when we met at dinner table or lunch table, when we had visitors coming through. Um, very early on, my parents you know, invited me to watch the news on TV at eight o'clock. And of course, uh, often these were the German news and Cold War was always on the news. Both of my parents were deeply involved in Cold War history. My father grew up in Zurich in very, very poor circumstances in the late 20s and in the 30s. He lost his parents very early. Um, he lived with an uncle and then was an apprentice, you know, an in-house apprentice. Uh, and so he worked himself out of poverty and um, um, basically became, you know, uh, uh, first a plumber and then essentially was running a company by the 1950s. But he always was interested in charitable work and he volunteered to work for the International Red Cross, first in Poland in the late 40s, where he was eventually arrested and expelled as a spy in 1984. And then, then in South Korea after the end of the Korean War from 1953 to 1954. So you, um, you said he was expelled as a spy. Yes. Uh, how, how did that come about? Well, was he doing any well, kind of suspicious activities or? Well, he was actually, as I said, he was working for the Red Cross and he was stationed in Warsaw. Um, but his, his duty was to distribute overstock US uh, army uh, stuff. You know, it's mostly actually, you know, um, bedding, food and so that the Americans had brought to West Europe and that was sort of ended up in Poland. And um, he had a US army truck. He had to learn how to drive it on spot. And then he did, it was up to him to decide what to do. So he decided to work together with Catholic churches. He was not Catholic, he was a Protestant. And he basically drove this truck to churches in the villages around, around, around Warsaw and then even further away and just redistributed, you know, this, uh, this surplus stock. Uh, he did not want to work with the government, so he decided to work with the Catholic Church. And that was sort of a little bit also, you know, probably politically suspicious in by 48 when uh, Stalinization really started after the arrest of, of Gomolka. And then, uh, having seen that scene in Poland, he, he went off to different shores. Uh, he, he was off to Asia, right? Yes, I mean, that was five years later, because as a Red Cross delegate, you weren't allowed to, uh, to go to a war zone at that time. But as soon as the war ended with the armistice in October, he got a call and uh, where he was working and said, in three days, you're on an airplane to South Korea. And so he had no English and uh, was there for a year and helped to rebuild uh, some of these, uh, uh, the hospitals that were destroyed in the Korean War. <laughs> he officially had a rank in the US Army, he was a mayor, 
And the reason why he had this rank is this gave him access to planes to Japan to organize materials, pipes, pumps, you know, whatever he needed to rebuild a hospital. So he flew often back and forth in American airplanes to Japan to organize materials. And um, this is sort of sparked my interest actually in Asia because he for the first time had some money here and actually quite good money and he could go to the American PX stores. This is sort of the stores for the soldiers and he bought a, a, an eight millimeter film camera and a, a, a slide projector and he took a lot of slides and films and he showed these films to me in the 70s and 80s and this is sort of how I fell in love to a certain degree with Asia. Mm -hmm. He eventually actually took the ship back uh, from Korea. Uh, and as you indicated, that kind of formed your uh, interest in Asia. Uh, similarly, I, I think uh, if you look at the story of your mother, uh, which is equally interesting uh, yeah. on a different level, maybe you could uh, indicate some of her uh, interesting stories or her background as well. Yes. So my mother was born in 1929, grew up in Hitler, Germany, and at the age of 16, first was actually American occupied in April 1945. And in July, the Americans withdrew from that little town where she grew up, south of Leipzig. And then, it, um, you know, the Soviets came and was Soviet occupied. Her family was rather wealthy in this small uh, town. So uh, their house became actually the Soviet Commandatura. They were expelled from, from the house and the Soviets took over actually the town commander or uh, the Soviet town commander took over the, the villa and that became the headquarters. And um, so, and since she was the daughter of a capitalist, she realized that she didn't really have a chance, a professional chance. And once she, um, passed her abitur, the not abitur, an emergency sort of high school diploma examination. Uh, she decided to apply to study medicine in, uh, in Tübingen and eventually got a spot and this enabled her to move to what was then the American zone, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she stayed there and then studied and um, um, became a doctor at the age of, um, I think, 24. And then by the age of 27, she already ran a, a part of a whole hospital. This at a time when uh, there was a shortage of uh, physicians in, in Germany. Um, she eventually married into Switzerland in 1964, but since we had this, this German family that was split in, in East and West Germany, and we had still friends and for a while relatives until my grandfather died and my grandmother moved to West Germany in the early 70s, my mother sent always care parcels to, uh, to East Germany. We were living close to the border, to the uh, German border. She worked actually in southern Germany. She was not allowed to work in Switzerland. Her diploma was not, uh, medical diploma was not actually recognized in Switzerland at the time. And at that time, so she went basically, she sent Swiss chocolate and Swiss coffee from West Germany to East Germany that was subsidized. And I remember her packing actually these care parcels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just I remember her asking, well, why do our relatives not buy this, these things in their supermarkets? And then my mother sort of made a disparaging remark, you know, and said, well, you know, they don't have that stuff. And so that was really my, my interest in the Cold War. I wanted to figure out why is Germany actually split and why does my mother send these care parcels? And then later this, this Asian interest, you know, came in and... When I went to the University of Zurich and we had, I was in a Cold War class with Professor Spielmann, um, you know, I insisted on writing on the Cold War in East Asia. I was Japan uh, at that time. Uh, that was my interest via my father, but I realized it's not such an interesting story in itself that the China story is the more interesting one. And that's why I decided then to learn Chinese and, and work on China at the Cold War. That, was, that became my first book on the Sinusoid split. Mm -hmm. and, and that looks specifically at the period from 1956 to 1966, obviously a, a very fascinating period in, in the, uh, one would say, mid-Cold War period. Um, yeah. um, 1956, obviously, also time of the Hungarian uh, uprising. And, and I think if, even in Switzerland, we could feel that uh, effect with refugees from Hungary arriving in Switzerland. Yeah. So this was a little bit after the period of my father's uh, visit of my father's uh, life in Asia. He left in 55. Um, I wanted to write a dissertation that did not involve a Cold War dissertation that was not primarily about the United States. And so mm -hmm. I chose China. So it's split. I learned Chinese, I learned Russian. I worked in the Russian archives, partially also in the Chinese archives. 
And it's really this mid period, 56 to 66. Uh, it's the, of course, it, the Hungarian Revolution is a part of that story at the very beginning. And that's sort of also connected to um, you know, my friendship with the children of Hungarian immigrants, Hungarian refugees mm -hmm. in, in the late 50s and who settled near Basel. Uh, I had a, a year below me and the gymnasium in Münchenstein, there was there were Hungarian, the children of Hungarian refugees. There were, however, in our school, there were refugees from South Vietnam, you know, came as boat people in the late 70s. In my form, there was a, the, the daughter of Ukrainian immigrants, right? Um, and there was also somebody from Czechoslovakia who fled and was stateless and uh, became a professional hockey player in Switzerland, in fact. So um, uh, this, the, I was in this milieu of, um, first of all, there was my family background that was so closely tied to the Cold War, but there was, maybe I sought out also this milieu of other Cold War refugees, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, Germans living in, in Switzerland. And the first question I had a lot is, do you have any relatives in East Germany? And of course, many of them had, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a kind of, a, a, a maybe not that present from, or not clear for many uh, Swiss people at the time, but there was sort of a, a group of people that were very closely connected to events in the Cold War, because they had roots actually outside of, of, of Switzerland, often in what used to be the East Bloc. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I th think you already delineated very clearly some of the uh, causes or, or the background, how your awareness for the Cold War has developed in your teenage years already in, in the 1980s. And as I say, in, in Switzerland, the Cold War in the 1980s was probably not as present as here in North America, where duck and cover exercises were, were done in schools. I, I don't recall that uh, for myself back in Switzerland in the 80s. Uh, and this, uh, be it noted, is the time when we talked about the stationing of uh, SS-20s and Pershings and, and all those decisions, which were of large consequence, but in certain respect, not really tangible, I, I think, for a young person in Switzerland, uh, the way you would think uh, with the hindsight that we have nowadays. Mm -hmm. And now in, in that regard, um, maybe what was this reason for you then to say, OK, I, I studied in Switzerland, but to study Cold War, uh, I have to go abroad uh, to, to mm -hmm. continue my studies on a PhD level? Or what was the motivation to leave Switzerland? I sort of knew very early on as a teenager that I wanted to become a historian and maybe a professor, right? I mean, you can't plan that. And you, of course, you know, as a teenager, you have strange ideas about uh, how things work, right? And uh, looking back, I found this quite, I find this quite audacious that I had this plan and how little I knew about actually the academic system. Um, so I went to Zurich. Um, in 1990 to study and I was lucky to study with Professor Spielmann who came really a big actually supporter of my career. Um, my father, my, given that my parents were so actually tied to the Cold War and my, my father had been with the US Army in South Korea, my mother was a refugee from the Soviets, they were incredibly pro-American. They were social Democrats but they were pro-American. And uh, my father had always the dream to visit the United States as a tourist. Um, but it was very expensive in the 80s. And I had, via the University of Zurich and the ETH Zurich, I had the chance to participate in an exchange. So I went to the United States as an exchange student, 92, 93, to a small college upstate New York. And my father was really happy that I would do this. And he eventually visited me. And that was the reason why he basically had, he had a reason now to come and, and visit the United States. And while I was there, um, I realized that really, uh, I probably have to do my PhD in the United States for two reasons. One is uh, the academic system in Switzerland is very small. And many of the positions that would become available in the near future were sort of, you know, there were people further ahead in the pipeline. So it would have been very difficult for me to, to get a position. And I also realized that um, probably, you know, if you do Cold War history, you know, the best place to do it is North America, and maybe not necessarily Switzerland, right? Given the archives, given the sheer size of the academic system. So I returned from uh, Union College and connected in the summer 1993 um, with basically you know, the plan to go back after I finished my Licenciatsarbeit, which I finished on an American topic. 
uh, and I went back first to Ohio University in 95 because I wanted to study with, at that time, the most famous Cold War historian, John Lewis Gaddis. He was mm -hmm. at Ohio University. That's also a really, really funny story uh, because I, and I actually switched out of, of Ohio to Yale. And the reason was that in my first year at Ohio, Gaddis was on leave. Mm -hmm. And he returned in April 1996, and he sent me an email, come and see me in my office tomorrow afternoon. So the first time I meet him, he tells me that he's going to leave Ohio University because he got a named chair at Yale. Mm -hmm. uh, the first reaction was, you know, internally, oh, my God, I came all the way to Ohio on my <laughs> man. Uh, who is the reason why I came, you know, is deserting me, right? But um, he was still a year at Ohio University and he asked me to reapply and basically he left in 97 and I had to reapply and I had to restart my PhD program at Yale. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought, right, uh, that I would end up at Yale? And this is sort of also a funny story, you know, that tied to that. In 1985, my, uh, my parents and my brother and I went on a road trip through, through England and we visited Cambridge and I walked across this Gothic uh, Tudor style actually the campus and I promised myself that at one time in my life I would study or work at a place like this and then mm -hmm. I ended up at this neo-gothic actually campus <laughs> at Yale which wasn't the plan but you know I remember that when I, when I arrived at, at Yale and really in 1997 the, the big adventure of my life started right if you already think you know there's a lot of adventure that was really the big adventure um, mm -hmm. Um, I continued to study Chinese and Russian. I spent one and a half years in China studying Chinese, actually, and doing research. Spent two summers in Russia and a whole semester in Russia doing research, uh, a whole semester in Berlin, all for my dissertation, uh, for the purpose of improving my language skills. And I finished, actually, this dissertation in 2003. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, as a non-citizen in the United States, you start to plan at one point, uh, where do you see your future? Mm -hmm. And um, I had just written two chapters out of 10 in the fall of 2002. And I decided to go on the so-called job market to try, right, to apply. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, I got four interviews and two job offers, uh, one in Singapore and one in Canada. And by March 19, uh, 2003, I uh, was in a, in, in a situation where I knew by August 1st, I started a job and I still had to write six out of 10 chapters of my dissertation. And uh, that prospect makes your fingers very fast on your keyboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I started, I wasn't really done. Uh, I submitted my dissertation in, in September 2003. I already started to teach. It was quite an adventure again, you know, moving to Canada. And uh, eventually I just stayed in Canada. There were personal reasons. I found a partner here as well very quickly. I originally thought I would go back to Canada and um, now I'm here. And, um, you know, there are some reasons why I decided to stay. Um, mm -hmm. One is that I think politics are somewhat saner than in the United States. And the yeah. other one is there's actually a lot of research money available and the third one is this enabled me to continue my kind of cold war history in which the united states does not play a central role um, mm -hmm. if you are at an american university it's always the united states in the cold war but here in canada you know the united states isn't that important and canada is also not that important so you have a kind of intellectual freedom that allows you to explore parts of the cold war in which the United States and maybe not even the, the Soviet Union are dot central. Mm -hmm. And that really, given that the availability of research money enabled me now to pursue that kind of, of, of historiography. Can you compare the Canadian academic system with the Swiss academic mm -hmm. system? So first of all, what I would say is per student, there are more professors at Canadian universities, right? And there is, um, so you, you, in the 90s, there was this problem of the Masson seminar, you know, a seminar, a research seminar with 100, 120 students. And the professor was sitting in, had two assistants, and they were running the seminar. Now, a seminar here is between eight and 25 students. And this allows 
me as a, a, as a member of faculty really to pay much greater attention to individual students and to work with them more closely, to read drafts, to give them more feedback. In terms of lecture courses, you try to basically, as a department, to cover various areas with introductory uh, lectures, large lectures that cover, and you know, let's say, East Asia from 1600 to 2000, which are just taught, or you know, international relations from roughly 1750 to 1950. And I miss this a little bit in, in, uh, in the Swiss, so maybe you know, the German language system where many of the, the smaller courses are very focused, right? Uh, and the lectures, the lecture courses occasionally reflect sort of the personal interests of, of, of the professor, not necessarily sort of the needs of the program to provide students with a, a large scale overview of history. There's more money actually in, in the Swiss system. You know, it's not only salary, but it's also research money. But um, in terms of research money in Canada, if you apply to Shirk or in Quebec to FQRC and its successor organizations, you have uh, plenty of money to do the research uh, you want to do, be it archival research, be it quantitative research. So uh, money is not an issue. That's an issue in the United States if you are not at one of the 10 big universities that have huge endowments. Um, so we are quite blessed here in Canada when it comes to research money. Mm -hmm. How has the whole COVID situation affected your research uh, abilities to, to go abroad? That must have been really difficult. Right. It hasn't really affected me personally. It has affected a lot of my colleagues because I had the good or the bad luck to get my last book uh, into my hands uh, in, in print, in physical uh, form, you know, on March 12, 2020, the day before the, the day lockdown before. in Canada started. <laughs> yeah. I was done with this really huge project uh, for which I have worked around 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, uh, uh, personally, I was falling a little bit in a, into a hole. I, I realized that I had some smaller projects I wanted to, uh, to finish up. I wrote an article about Asterix and the Cold War. I had wanted to do that for 25 years. I used the pandemic actually to do it. It's out now, um, and it gave me a little bit time to rethink where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, I, I want to come back to to your monograph that you published in 2020. It's called "Cold Wars: East Asia, the Middle East, and Europe." Uh, you published it with Cambridge University Press. So, at least even if you didn't go on the campus of Cambridge to teach, uh, you found Cambridge University Press uh, for your book. It's a tome, uh, a large volume of 770 pages, and as the Title already indicates um, the complexity and the geographical reach of this study is, is really vast. Um, as you argue, I, I think it's not just one Cold War, but there were several Cold Wars. Um, how would you summarize kind of the key findings of, of this work? Um, maybe I should very quickly talk about where it comes from. It's it, it developed out of my first book on the Sinusoid Split. Again, I was interested in writing um, a Cold War history in which the superpowers were not um, dominant in, in the narrative. Um, we have all these, these histories. I mean, the vast majority of books on the Cold War are American-centric, and we have now some Soviet-centric books, but there is a trend now, and it has been a trend for 10 years to so look at, at you know, other stories, other narratives. It is um, the hegemonic actually position of Sino uh, Soviet American relations with the United States and Cold War historiography is now slowly undermined by, uh, by new research. So that was where I came from. Um, the other sort of background was I wanted to really reintegrate decolonization into the story because that's the other big history or story in the 20th century. It's not only the Cold War. And many of the Cold War conflicts basically uh, you know, graft themselves onto decolonization stories. And that required me, if you take decolonization seriously, not just as a stage in which the Cold War actually develops and you basically oversee it from the Cold War lens and never from the, from the lens of decolonization. Uh, so uh, that's a problem for me. And this is also why the story starts with Asia and, and then goes to the Middle East and to Europe. I also wanted to break up this Eurocentric vision of the Cold War. Many of the conflicts that uh, we occasionally or 
more often than not see as Cold War conflicts are not necessarily Cold War conflicts. Um, China is a civil war. Vietnam is a civil war, right? It, it's a civil conflict that becomes, the Vietnam War becomes first then an anti-colonial conflict and then a Cold War conflict in 1950. And we forget that there was a first a Vietnam War anyway from 1946 to 1954. And the second Vietnam is Vietnam War is the Vietnam War you usually remember, right? Mm -hmm. So I was interested in really taking decolonization seriously. And of course, you know, then this led to a sort of uh, a less Eurocentric interpretation. Um, I didn't really have a plan. Uh, books develop, don't develop according to a blueprint. They develop as you do research and as you realize certain of your ideas don't work out. And then you, you, you change direction and you include new topics. Um, so several things came in. I was interested in what's the role of religion actually in the cold war what's the role of islam or the catholic church in the form of the vatican what's the role of economics what's the role of ideas and ideology how do they undermine actually you know cold war alignments mm -hmm. and ultimately you know where i ended up is i ended up in seeing the 20th century really also as a as a, as a century of continued nation state formation much of this is not necessarily related or not always related to the Cold War. And in some cases, it's not the Cold War that imposes itself on, on, on a development on the ground. It's a development on the ground that draws in, that manipulates and changes the Cold War. And certainly in the case of Poland, uh, there's a lot been written about the role of the Catholic Church in the, in the fall of the system in, in the late 80s, yeah. uh, the influence of the Pope, obviously, uh, Karol Wojtyla. And when we look at the history, the way you present it, obviously there, there's a lot of uh, big power diplomacy, but not, not only big powers, as you said, there's other elements, ideology plays into it. And this kind of draws us into uh, current topics, uh, current issues. Most people will realize that the term or the terminology Cold War has come to the front again in recent months, uh, looking at the current developments in not only in Russia, but also in China. Um, people have started to talk about the turning point or a new epoch in history. Uh, from your perspective as, as Cold War historian, do you, do you perceive the current times as, as a dramatic turning point in history? Um, I'm copping out now. I just announced this right away because I'm a historian and uh, usually you see actually turning points in retrospect and also as historians we try actually to periodicize we try to impose order on the past and this is how we make history right by, by ordering the past which is caudic and we try to introduce order to make it legible and then it becomes history history is what we how we interpret actually the past right so can we say is this a new epoch um, um i don't know yet and this is why I'm, 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 I'm copying out here. Fair enough. <laughs> Very clear um, to me that uh, Putin's Russia um, uh, poses a challenge to the post-Cold War order in Europe. It has posed this challenge before. So is it 2022 or is it 2014 or 2008? And we just didn't realize it the way we might not have realized or contemporaries might not have realized what is happening in the 30s with Germany, right? Um, uh, certainly, you know, uh, I think this is a major challenge to the international order. Um, I think Putin is failing. Uh, um, and in fact, you know, it looks like that uh, his challenge has just reinforced that uh, post-Cold War order. Um, but it's definitely, you know, a, a serious major hiccup in sort of the development of, uh, of post-Cold War Europe. Now, are we talking about a new Cold War? That is a, a topic I have thought about in the last couple of years quite uh, often, largely because the new Cold War was mentioned in the context of the Sino-American competition. And um, I would not say that this is a new Cold War, uh, simply because the Cold War uh, had clear ideological actually underpinnings. It divided the world. Um, the United States and uh, China are hugely economically interdependent. Uh, 
ultimately China wants to become a part of, of the order, tries to transform it, but it's not a, a fundamental Leninist challenge to the order. So I don't see the Sino-American competition as a Cold War. But the question is now, um, is Putin not trying to revive something like the Cold War in Europe in terms of division of territorial dominance, of economic disintegration. Um, definitely, he uses um, symbols. Uh, he uses um, ideological phrases. I don't say ideology, ideological phrases. I mean, his, this whole Nazi discourse is very clearly a Soviet discourse. The Soviets have used this since the 1950s. Everybody who did not agree with the Soviets were automatically labeled as Nazis. And you can always then mobilized uh, Soviet public opinion, or you could at that time uh, mobilize Soviet public opinion behind the regime because we are continuing uh, you know, the great patriotic war and we, we suppress the Nazis. And um, Putin has um, uh, basically revived these kinds of tropes and narratives in the last 10 to 15 years. He uses Soviet history to justify what he is doing. Uh, before February 24th, I always thought that this is purely instrumental. At the moment, I'm not quite sure anymore, given, you know, the kind of Soviet flags that now show up, the restoration of Lenin statues in so-called liberated areas in, in Ukraine, the idea of economic decoupling. I'm, I'm not quite sure at the moment. I'm a little bit disturbed by it, and I'm, I'm unsure. I'm uncertain how to, how to see that. But my sense is that is, is probably his attempt. Is he going to succeed? I doubt it. I'm afraid our time is already up. As a historian, you have many stories to tell, which is obviously very fascinating. Your personal life story uh, in and of itself already a, a very special history, so to speak. And we have encompassed pretty much all corners of the world in, in this past uh, podcast conversation. So uh, thank you very much for your insight, uh, Lawrence Lipti, and I wish you all the best uh, for your next steps and your next research project. And thank you for having me. This was really fun to do. And, uh, you know, all the best for you too. Thank you.